So I want to welcome you all to the third installment of the Wedgwood International's seminar Zoom lecture series. We're looking forward to yet another large audience as we've had in our previous two lectures. I'd like to tell all of you some really exciting WIS news. As you know, all the lectures have been recorded and now the big news is WIS has a dedicated YouTube channel. Each of the Zoom lectures will be available on YouTube for anyone to view again, or even for the first time. Uh, we're continuously working on adding to and improving the information on our WIS YouTube channel with the goal of actually several goals being um, increasing our membership, educating people about Wedgwood, and also sharing the knowledge that our esteemed speakers impart during these lectures. So I'll tell you more about this at the end. Uh, a quick few words about how this uh, today's meeting will be conducted. Dr. Ann Forshla Tarish will be today's moderator, and she will introduce our speaker, Ginny Blake Roberts. The lecture will be followed by time for a question and answer session. And I would like to remind all of you to please write your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And I will now turn the lecture over to Anne. Thank you so much, Lorraine, and welcome everyone. Good afternoon or good evening. Our speaker today, Gay Blake Roberts, needs no real introduction. I think we're all familiar with her groundbreaking work on Wedgwood and the recognition of her as the leading scholar on Wedgwood. Recently retired after an illustrious 40-year career as curator of the Wedgwood Museum, Gay now serves as honorary senior research fellow attached to the Research Institute at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And there she continues her scholarly work and her work as a writer and author of many publications. And I hope that everyone's seen her recent work for that fantastic catalog, Majolicomania, the three volume catalog that recently came out that includes a section on Wedgwood Majolica. Today, Gay will tell us the story of Thomas Bentley, Josiah Wedgwood's friend and partner. So welcome Gay and thank you so much. Thank you indeed. Right, screen share. I love technology when it doesn't work. Here we go. Hopefully you can all see that now. Yes? Yes. Uh, good. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Anne. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Much has been written and spoken about the life and achievements of Josiah Wedgwood over the years. But controversially, I would conjecture that whilst Josiah would have always been an exceedingly accomplished potter, a man with an inquiring mind, his position as a celebrated potter of great renown, superb marketeer, and a man of science probably would not have been so universally recognised without the extraordinary friendship and business relationship with the man Josiah was pleased to call my much esteemed friend. Bentley's role in and significance has been greatly overshadowed by the lack of documentation or written documentation and the necessity to interpret his importance through Josiah's side of their exceptional correspondence, some aspects of which I would like to address in this lecture, although this is currently ongoing research at present and will only cover certain aspects of their extraordinary friendship and of course their subsequent partnership. Thomas Bentley wrote in December 1778, I have not any friend here by whose side I have been accustomed to engage and conquer, and who has the same energy that you constantly possess when there is need for it, either to promote the public good, assist your friends, 
or support your own rights when I, I fancy I can do anything with your help and have been so much used to it that when you are not with me upon these occasions, I seem to have lost my right arm. This comment goes some way to explain the esteem in which Bentley came to regard his friend and later confidant, Josiah Wedgwood. The closeness of their friendship and mutual respect is one of the most interesting and intriguing aspects of the interconnection between them, especially with the development within the 18th century ceramic industry, with its unprecedented explosion of new ideas and new technological inventions which transformed the industrialization of the country, leading to extraordinary economic and social changes. Thomas Bentley and Josiah Wedgwood were, in some respects, almost complete opposites. The dogmatic Josiah, the academic Bentley, the country potter and the city society man, yet they discovered total compatibility and a rare friendship which acted as a catalyst to each other. The relationship between them was founded in many ways on the role of pupil and teacher. Josiah was eager to seek Bentley's opinion and emulate his taste. Josiah saw in Bentley a man of superior learning, sophistication and refined taste, so much in contrast to his own lack of education and humble beginnings. Josiah was nothing if not an opportunist, nor was he diffident in wanting to foster his career. But the attraction of Bentley for Wedgwood was most probably the admiration of a man of ideas, inventiveness and action. For despite their common interests, Bentley was a more sensitive, scholarly, quiet man rather than an intuitive leader. Whilst Josiah developed an exuberant personality and had charm, honesty, humour and of course courage. Josiah's feelings towards Thomas Bentley were expressed in a letter of February 1768. It is an old adage that a man is either a fool or a physician at 50. And considering the opportunities I have with the Brindleys and the Bentleys of this age, if I'm not a very wise mortal before that age, I must be a blockhead in grain. It was Bentley whose refinement, education and good taste which was to mould the successful trading activities of the company, especially in London, and provide both information on the changing fashions and contacts which would assist in the creation of wares to complement the newest tastes needed to keep their wares at the forefront of popularity. The intellectual climate in Britain during the 18th century led to a wide circulation of technological and scientific achievements. The easy collaboration between the ideas and men of science and action became what is now known as the Industrial Enlightenment. The scientific revolution and enlightenment opened new paths for independent thought and all the scientific fields were dramatically changed and considerably expanded. Man, men approached new branches of the sciences with enthusiasm and excitement. And Bentley was amongst that group of intellectual thinkers who changed the face of education, commerce and industry. Thomas Bentley was born into an old established and affluent Derbyshire family. His grandfather had several sons of whom two, Thomas and William, both became clergymen in the Church of England. Thomas, however, left the Church of England to join one of the more liberal and more highly educated sects, the Presbyterians, from whom R. Thomas Bentley probably derived his independent and broad outlook on life. Thomas's father died in October 1774 and his mother Dorothy in November 1778, both at Scropton, Derbyshire. Thomas Bentley was born in Scropton on the 1st of January 1730. His parents being dissenters probably explain why Thomas's baptism into the Church of England was deferred until he was six years of age when it took place at St Paul's Church, Scropton on the 18th of February 1736. 
it seems probable that his baptism was required to allow him to attend the local parish school to commence his formal education, as children of dissenters were not permitted to attend church schools at that time. Amongst Thomas's relations were Walter Horton Bentley of Manchester, a great naturalist and intimate friend of J.J. Audubon. Similarly, a distant relative was Richard Bentley, who worked for Bolton and Watt at the Soho Works for 50 years and may have been instrumental, in part, in the initial association between Bentley, Bolton and Wedgwood. From 1740, Bentley was educated for six years at the Presbyterian Collegiate Academy at Finden, five miles southwest of Derby. An institution of considerable reputation which taught boarding pupils between 1712 and 1754. There is little reliable evidence as to the origins of the Finden Academy. It was established by Thomas Hill. His successor, Dr Ebenezer Latham, was the tutor for the greater part of the Academy's history. Sadly, the name of only 22 of Hill's students are known, but they were predominantly from the local gentry and wealthy families who supported the dissenting movement. There is evidence that classical languages were one of the principal disciplines taught, amongst other subjects, which included chemistry, natural sciences, mathematics, astronomy and modern languages such as French. Few details are known about the Academy's domestic arrangements. Latham's wife appears to have been responsible for running the household. The Academy at Findon was housed in a building in Doles Lane, later converted into a row of cottages, whilst the students probably lodged with members of the local congregation. <coughs> Excuse me. Thomas Bentley lodged with a Mrs Massey, who, 30 years later, probably on Bentley's suggestion, became Wedgwood's housekeeper during the critical illness of Sarah Wedgwood in 1772. At Finden, Bentley showed an aptitude for languages and classical studies, which were to stand him in good stead in later life. He left the academy when he was 16 years of age and was indentured by his family as an apprentice in 1746 to a wholesale wool and cotton merchant probably Mr Berry of Manchester. The choice of Manchester was probably based on both family connections and because Man Manchester was a thriving non-conformist business community. Manchester was renowned as a centre for the manufacture of woolen, cotton and fustian cloth and flax yarn. However, by the 18th century, Manchester had emerged as a manufacturing and commercial town of national importance. For the next seven years, two years longer than the usual apprenticeship, Bentley underwent his formal training, concentrating on bookkeeping and accountancy, and where he acquired an insight into business practice, which was to be important in his future career. With the restoration of peace in Europe, through the Treaty of Aix la Chapelle of 1748, which ended the War of Austrian Succession, Bentley, then aged 23 years of age, took the opportunity during 1753, encouraged by his parents and employers, to travel abroad, visiting both France and Italy, not only to see the art galleries, but to perfect both his French and Italian. <coughs> After completing his mini grand tour, Thomas Bentley commenced in business on his own account as a woolen warehouseman and cotton agent, renting premises in King Street, Liverpool from 1754. As yet, I have been unable to ascertain whether the capital to establish his business was provided by his family or was in the form of temporary loans from his friends who considered his who had great confidence, should I say, in his aptitude and ability. Bentley conducted various shipping activities in the capacity of an agent for his friends and former associates from Manchester, as well as developing his woolen and cotton warehouse. 
Bentley was married in 1754 at St Mary's and All Saints Church, Chesterfield, Derbyshire, to Hannah Oates, the middle of three daughters of a wool merchant, Mr James Oates, whom he had met through mutual business and activities. Through this marriage, Bentley became acquainted with many highly educated and interesting people, including the Jebb family. James's wife was for me, formerly Amelia Jebb. Richard Jebb was one of the physicians to King George III, and several others were clergymen and academics who held high office at Cambridge University. Interestingly, Hannah's niece was Anne Ward, afterwards known as Mrs Anne Ratcliffe, the renowned author and pioneer of Gothic fiction, who became one of the most popular writers of her day and universally admired. Bentley and his new wife moved into one of the most fashionable parts of Liverpool, Paradise Street, which was situated on the north side of the Mersey. Sadly, he was left a widower in 1759 when his wife died in childbirth after only five years of marriage. Bentley's religious inclination found expression in the liberal atmosphere of Liverpool, where the various non-conformist chapels outnumbered the Anglican churches. Bentley's broad liberal views greatly deplored the fact that dissenters at the time were not admitted the full rights of citizenship and they were not allowed to have their children educated at the church schools. Similarly, he, along with many of his fellow Liverpudlians, were concerned at the closure of several local schools and proposed to acquire a building midway between Manchester and Liverpool, located in Warrington, where they created an educational establishment, which ultimately became known as the Warrington Academy. <clears throat> Warrington was an important centre, with many roads converging on the town so that he could cross the River Mersey. Bentley became one of the founding trustees and from 1758 a member of the management committee. For most of its short duration, just over a quarter of a century, from 1756 to 1782, it was extremely successful and the Warrington Academy included amongst its tutors and students several outstanding personalities, many of whom would become closely associated with Josiah Wedgwood and assist him with his researches and business connections. Even Josiah's son, John, attended as a pupil. The Academy employed amongst its first masters and tutors people with known intellectual reputations, including Dr. William Taylor of Norwich, John Holt, the distinguished mathematician, and Dr. Joseph Priestley, who was both a theologian and, of course, an eminent scientist, who is now recognised for his discovery of oxygen. Priestley was originally employed in 1761 for six years as the tutor of languages and belles lettres, or polite literature, although he would have undoubtedly preferred to be teaching mathematics or natural philosophy. He was succeeded by the celebrated Prussian naturalist Johann Forster, a Calvinist pastor and naturalist of Scottish descent, who made a major contribution in the early studies of ornithology of Europe, North America, as well as other places, but is now best known and remembered as the official naturalist who circumnavigated the globe on James Cook's second voyage of 1772. It was, however, almost certainly at Bentley's house in Paradise Street that Wedgwood first met Joseph Priestley. Priestley records his regular visits to Liverpool, writing in his memoir, I was always received by Mr Bentley, afterwards partner with Mr Wedgwood, a man of excellent taste, improved understanding and a good disposition, but an unbeliever in Christianity, which was therefore often the subject of our conversations. He was then a widower and we generally, and contrary to my usual custom, sat up late. The Academy was described as the cradle of Unitarianism and the centre of liberal politics 
and literary taste of the county of Lancashire. When the academy was dissolved in 1786, 393 pupils had been taught there, many of whom entered the legal or medical professions. Interestingly, Bentley's associate, William Willett, the Unitarian minister, who was closely associated with the Warrington Academy, later became Josiah Wedgwood's brother-in-law. Thomas Bentley, as a patriotic Englishman, enlisted in the Liverpool Regiment of Gentlemen Volunteers, one of the independent companies to be raised in February 1760, at a time when the port of Liverpool was thrown into consternation by the approach in the Irish Sea of a French naval expedition approaching the Mersey. The hostile flotilla was commanded by Francois Thoreau, a notorious sailor who planned to descend upon North Britain, Scotland, and then on to Ireland with the intention of attacking the Lancashire coast and Liverpool before returning to France. <coughs> William Pitt, the minister, prime minister at the time, became very aware of the French plans and made full preparations for land and coastal defences. It was thought that Thoreau's aim was to attack and plunder the rich port of Liverpool. The magistrates quickly organised the defences of their opulent town. It was proposed that 20 volunteer companies of 100 men each to be armed and paid for by the inhabitants. He also intended to erect batteries on which they could mount 50 cannons. Eventually, Thoreau attacked Ireland rather than Lancashire before being destroyed by the pursuing English squadron under Captain Elliot. Bentley contributed significantly to life in Liverpool and not long after his arrival, he became a member of one of the reading societies of which Liverpool merchants and professional men read and discussed the latest books and journals. This ultimately developed into the Philosophical Club. Bentley also became one of the most enthusiastic supporters for the support of a more permanent establishment, leading to the formation of the Liverpool Library, opened on the 1st of May 1758, which was one of the earliest gentlemen's subscription libraries in England, which was widely imitated by other provincial towns. The entry fee ensured exclusivity, initially set at one guinea with an annual subscription of five shillings. Apart from these activities, Bentley also played an active role in the development and construction of the Octagon Chapel, which opened in June 1763. The Octagon Chapel was a non-conformist church founded by local congregations. As the name suggests, the building had eight sides and was designed by Joseph Finney and was built actually in Temple Court. The congregation inevitably were nicknamed the Octogenarians. The chapel's existence depended very much on Thomas Bentley until he moved to London. The aim was to use a non-sectarian liturgy, which Thomas Bentley played a significant role in actually writing and developing. However, this experimental liturgy did not gain the anticipated support from those in the founding congregations. Bentley continued the support of the cause, and this is very clearly illustrated in a letter written a little later by Wedgwood from Staffordshire, when he asks, Can you part from your octagon and enlightened octogenarian brethren? Can you give up the rational and elevated enjoyment of your philosophical club for a puerile tete-a-tete -tete at a country fireside? Bentley continued to be a regular attender at the Octagon Chapel, and years later, in 1776, when he was resident in London, he expressed great concern on learning that the services at the chapel had been discontinued, complaining bitterly without a preliminary appeal to him for assistance. In 1762, Bentley's home and warehouse escaped unscathed in the great conflagration which devastated Liverpool. His business began to grow in importance and stature, and Bentley himself seems, from some references, to have become an alderman to Liverpool. He also held a standing brief to represent the corporation 
in all their important business before Parliament in London. And he spent much of 1765 representing the corporation in Westminster in connection with the new legislation on bankruptcy, which <clears throat> really I think indicates and shows the great uh, esteem in which he was regarded within the city. Liverpool derived much of its wealth from the slave trade, which Bentley, himself an overseas trader, had the strongest objection to and did his best to combat it at every occasion, which was not always a popular amongst the influential citizens who had financial interests directly and indirectly in the infamous trade. It was undoubtedly Bentley's strong feelings on this subject that introduced the topic to Wedgwood and probably influenced his ardent support for the abolitionist movement. The upsurge in the French war, which interfered with trade in London, meant that Liverpool rapidly increased in size and importance. Taking advantage of these changes, Bentley no longer restricted himself to the product of the spinning mills, but entered into a much broader sphere of business, becoming a general merchant, extending his transactions both overseas and at home. Such was his fame that letters addressed merely to Mr Bentley Merchant, Liverpool, would find him. In 1764, possibly due to his ever-expanding public duties undertaken by Bentley and his rapidly developing business, he took into partnership Samuel Boardman. Bentley and Boardman were associated through the Warrington Academy. Boardman had married Miss Nicholson, one of the Warrington Coterie. Bentley thought him a man of sound judgment and integrity, but lacked imagination. But as their friendship grew, Bentley invited him to become a partner. Over the years, Boardman proved to be of the utmost importance to the business because of his methodical ways and careful attention to detail, which are clearly illustrated in the enormous range of surviving manuscript orders from Bentley and Boardman. The legendary meeting between Josiah Wedgwood and Thomas Bentley has been well documented and referred to on numerous occasions. Suffice it to say, it reputedly happened due to an accident which confined Josiah to bed at the Golden Lion, Dale Street, where he was attended by Dr Matthew Turner. <clears throat> Turner was a surgeon who not only was a medical practitioner, but had a great interest in chemistry and regularly lectured on that subject at the Warrington Academy. Joseph Priestley records in his memoirs that he had little idea of the subject of chemistry before attending a course of Turner's chemical lectures at the Academy. He also gave it that his opinion gave his opinion of Turner that he was in his day a good practical chemist. It must be therefore conjectured that the subject of chemistry inevitably formed part of the conversations when Turner visited Wedgwood whilst he was incapacitated. Later, Wedgwood was to consult Turner about the manufacture of crucibles. Matthew Turner suggested to improve Josiah's enforced inactivity that he would introduce him to his friend and fellow dissenter, Thomas Bentley. From that time onwards, Bentley seems to have called on Josiah daily and they discussed a wide range of topics from religion, politics, commerce, art, and of course the ceramic industry and its export trade. On most topics, with the exception perhaps of pottery, Bentley was better qualified to speak, but Josiah sought Bentley's opinion and emulated his tastes. The intimate friendship between the two men is not difficult to understand. It is probable that Bentley saw in Wedgwood a mind and spirit capable of achieving great things. Before leaving Liverpool to return to the Brickhouse Works in Staffordshire, Josiah appointed Bentley as his agent in Liverpool, describing him as a pot merchant, despite his existing association with the printers Sadler and Green. From commencing in business for himself, Wedgwood was in the habit of having his cream-coloured earthenware not only printed by Sadler and Green, but using them to warehouse and distribute his wares within Britain to America and across the globe. 
Liverpool led the way in trade and commerce and Sadler continued his concession to sell Wedgwood despite the new and additional association with Bentley. Mutually agreed prices were settled upon so that neither firm could undercut the other. Within a week of arriving back in Staffordshire in May 1762, Josiah wrote to Bentley starting the correspondence which spanned the next 18 years with the words, My much esteemed friend, if you will give me leave to call you so, and will not think the address too free. I shall not care, care how Quakerish or otherwise antique it may sound, as it perfectly corresponds with the sentiments I have and wish to continue towards you. Over the years, <clears throat> Wedgwood occasionally comments on the importance of Bentley's letters to him, writing, The very feel of the letters, even before the seal is broke, cheers my heart and does me good. And you cannot think how happy you make me with these good, long, affectionate and instructive letters. They inspire me with taste, emulation and everything that is necessary for the production of fine things. And I hope in a few weeks to show you some of the effects of your excellent advice. What a feast I have had in this post. And on another occasion, how much I am indebted to my dear friend for his epistle and for the interest he takes in all that concerns me. But he also confesses to Bentley in September 1769 that your letters I must own are a little troublesome to me, for I cannot read them to my satisfaction without a heap of books by my side. Indeed, they are become my magazines, reviews, chronicles, I almost said my Bible. Bentley acted as an agent for Wedgwood, managing the shipment of useful wear cargoes, including shipping enormous quantities of cream coloured earthenware to France, and he would arrange to charter return cargoes of flintstone for use in the pottery industry. He also managed the import not only of Cornish clay, but a small but expensive shipment of clay from North Carolina, the Cherokee clay, which was actually used more for publicity than for utility. Wedgwood had sent Thomas Griffiths to America with the specific intention of acquiring examples of this clay, which was achieved with great difficulty. The employment of Thomas Griffiths was probably at the instigation of Bentley, who was a close friend of his brother, Ralph Griffiths, the editor of the Monthly Review or Literary Journal, which he had founded in 1749. Griffiths was a London bookseller and publisher and later became a neighbour of Bentley's in Turn and Breen near Chiswick. The monthly review became an instant success and earned Griffiths an estimated £2,000 a year. The monthly review promoted the fact that it would have no mercy in exploiting dull and uninteresting authors. Throughout his life, Griffiths was an avid collector of books, pamphlets and essays <clears throat> and was an early campaigner for improving the literary status of female poets and novelists. Like Bentley, he was a nonconformist, which probably is where they met and where their friendship began to develop. The common interests and shared understanding between Wedgwood and Bentley co continued to cover all aspects of their lives, and Bentley became a or quickly became a favoured and loved visitor in Staffordshire. Josiah's wife Sarah became a firm friend too and was able to send teasing messages in her husband's correspondence, such as the comment written on the 15th of September 1766. My Sally says your fat sides require a good deal of shaking and would recommend a journey on horseback, not in a coach to Burslem, and is half angry with me for coming home without you. Bentley was not averse to replying to the family in a similar light-hearted vein. For example, a postscript added to a business letter dated the 5th of December 1768 reads, Mr Bentley to Mr Wedgwood sendeth greetings. As there will certainly be another deluge, he advises Mr Wedgwood and the ladies to put the post-chaise and horses up for sale and buy a gondola. 
it will be much more useful here than anything that goes on wheels. I wish you were all safe at home again, which would be a great comfort to your friend. During the 1760s, Josiah was a powerful force in the project to link the potteries by canal with the River Mersey. The entrepreneurs and merchants of Liverpool were eager to play a part in the Industrial Revolution and their support for the new inland navigation was important. Throughout the initial negotiations and discussions, Bentley played a crucial part. The first meeting to discuss the canal was called on the 10th of June 1765 and Bentley was requested to prepare a pan text outlining the scheme. During the spring visit to Staffordshire, Wedgwood and Bentley spent an evening with Lord Gower at Trentham discussing the subject of the improved waterways and it was suggested that Bentley should represent the views and advantages in London, especially as he was regularly there in the capital on behalf of Liverpool. Eliza Metchard <clears throat> describes the pamphlet as being the impress of Bentley's hand, the concise method of expression and elegant diction. The pamphlet was entitled A Short View of the Several Advantages of the Inland Navigation Canal Intended as a Communication Between the Ports of Liverpool and Hull. The, te <coughs> excuse me, the text was amended by Dr Erasmus Darwin much to the annoyance of Bentley. The draft was completed in the autumn of 1765, announcing the scheme to a wider public. The pamphlet was published in the St James Chronicle on the 2nd of November 1765, and a thousand individual copies were printed in the same month <coughs> by Mr Beckett, a bookseller in the Strand, who coincidentally published Griffiths' monthly review and therefore was probably known to Bentley personally. Bentley acted as a negotiator with the Corporation of Liverpool and then played a significant role in the discussions about the proposed canal in London, which took five months from January to May 1766, including presenting evidence on behalf of Liverpool to Parliament. With the completion in 1777 of the Trent and Mercy Canal, or the Grand Trunk as it was known in the 18th century, it linked the landlocked Midlands to the port, dramatically easing the problems of transporting both fragile and heavy goods across poor roads. Its impact was to have a long-term effect on the viability of the manufacturing heartland and on the increased success of the ports. <coughs> As a result of Bentley's great interest in the canal project, he developed a very close friendship with James Brindley, the great engineer responsible for creating the canal, who also came from Derbyshire. Such was their friendship that on Brindley's death from diabetes in September 1772, Bentley was persuaded to co-write a memoir of him, which appeared in the Biographica Britannica. Ben Brindley bequeathed in his will a morning ring to Bentley as a token of his esteem and regard that he had for him. Bentley <coughs> excuse me, was also the author of several other pamphlets indicating his versatility, including such subjects as the improvement of female education and a defence of Lord Camden when he was deprived of the Great Seal. He also contributed regularly to both the Gentleman's Magazine and for many years to the Monthly Review, for which he was presented a silver dish by Ralph Griffiths in 1769. Josiah considered the inkstand to be extremely elegant when he saw it in Chelsea and ordered a replica to be made in black basalt. It has been conjectured that this unique dish with the signatures of Wedgwood and Bentley in script on the base could actually be that piece. Wedgwood wrote another very significant pamphlet advocating the advantages of cultivating derelict or wasteland, specifically articulating the advantages of draining wet, marshy areas through artificial draining. Bentley actually practiced <coughs> what he preached and bought in 1765 a portion of Chat Moss. 
Within a few years, by draining and cultivation, it was transformed into good, fertile farmland. Bentley's deep interest in the countryside possibly emanates from his roots in rural Derbyshire. His wider interests in industrial developments included the discovery of a valuable area of coal in South Lancashire and engaging in the new processes of tanning which were being developed. And he is even known to have carried out a series of scientific experiments suggested by Dr Fothergill on the use of copper, bronze and gold tint when applied to ceramic bodies. <clears throat> His interest in geology and keen eye to fossils also led to the discovery of a kind of biorites which could be used in the pottery industry. The great partnership between Wedgwood and Bentley in respect of ornamental wares probably would not have been considered without the main production of useful wares being under the guidance and control of useful Thomas, Josiah's cousin. Josiah had outlined the ideas for a new ornamental manufactory to Bentley in November 1766. <coughs> Negotiations were already underway to purchase the Ridge House estate, on which he was planned to construct a new purpose-built model factory, which became known as Etruria, together with a red brick house Etruria Hall, which was to be built for the Wedgwood family, and a large Georgian house, bank house, which was to be a residence for Bentley. Although he never actually occupied Bank House, during his brief stays in Staffordshire, he always stayed at Etruria Hall with the Wedgwood family. Josiah discussed every detail of the proposal with Bentley, and he was consulted at every step of the planning process. Eventually, Josiah wrote on the 3rd of March 1768, Survey and admire the, this last and perfect work of your friend, but do not presume to alter a line or an angle in the whole fabric, for I have sworn not to waver any longer. So help me, Bentley, to create new vases for the payment of my architect. On New Year's Eve, Josiah sent Bentley a series of sketches for a hovel, showing a selection of different shapes, from a milk churn to a crenellated castle keep. Not that Wedgwood was being particularly serious with his suggestions, and he added, they may be decorated with faces, blank windows at very little expense. He was dismayed when Bentley chose one, which caused him to write, Will not Gothic battlements to a building in every other respect of the modern taste be a little heterogeneous? With the proposal <clears throat> of a formal business partnership between the two men, it is evident that Josiah was not looking for a large investment or financial contribution from Bentley, commenting, the money objection is obviated to my hand. But he still wanted Bentley to become a full partner. Josiah wrote at some length on the 8th of November 1768, countering any objections raised by Bentley. Sorry, that should be 1766. But he, but proceed as now to downright business. I have read your letter many times over and find several of the or your find several of your objections to our near approach may be surmounted. The first is your total ignorance of business. That I deny. You have taste, which is the foundation for our intended concern. As to the rest, it will soon be learnt by so apt a scholar. The very air of this county will soon inspire you with the mere mechanical parts of our trade. Can you exchange your frequent opportunities of seeing and conversing with your learned and ingenious friends, which, you present, which your present situation affords you, besides 10,000 other elegances and employments of town life, to employ yourself amongst the <clears throat> mechanics, dirt and smoke, enlivened indeed with so much pastoral life as you shall choose for yourself on the Ridge House estate. If this prospect does not frighten you, I have some hopes. And if you think you can really fall in love with and make a mistress of this new business, as I have done mine, I should have no doubt of our success. 
draft partnership agreement written by ben, written in Bentley's hand from Warrington is dated the 15th of November 1767. The manuscript is endorsed in a second hand, basis of an agreement between W and B. It reads, resolved, that W and B do enter into partnership and make, to make ornamental earthenware or porcelain, viz, vases, figures, flower pots, toilet furniture, and such other articles as they shall from time to time agree upon. The partnership to continue for the space of 14 years. The Wedgwood and Bentley partnership agreement was formally signed on the 10th of August 1769, 68 days after the opening of the new Etruria works, which was marked by the making of six first days vases. Having initially settled in Staffordshire, it quickly became apparent that Bentley's talents would be of more use in London, and soon after Bentley left his business activities in Liverpool, leaving Samuel Boardman in sole charge of the warehouse and the distribution of Wedgwood's products, and departed from Etruria Hall in August 1769 to manage the Wedgwood Company's marketing activities in London, where he took charge of the showrooms in Great Newport Street. The arrangement caused Josiah to comment on the 20th of September 1779. In the distribution of our employment, W and B's, between us, the manufacture has fallen to my lot and the sales to yours. 1769 was a period of great activity for Bentley, not only moving with his sister-in-law, Miss Oates, who was his housekeeper, into rented accommodation above the Great Newport Street shop, but he and Samuel Boardman also moved into larger premises in Liverpool, which became known as the Manchester Stocking Warehouse, where Boardman required his assistance in the reorganisation of the offices and warehouse created by the move. The relocation was possibly influenced by the strong westerly gales of that year, which had caused considerable damage to both property and ships. Although Bentley's premises had been unaffected, he probably considered it prudent to move but it also provided additional space for their expanding business activities. Despite Bentley's busy life, he still found time to translate works from Latin or more frequently French scientific volumes, which were of interest to Josiah, such as L'Art de Turner by Charles Plumier and Macquire's Dictionary of Chemistry, which was also of great assistance to James Keir. Of the most use and assistance, to the productions of Tutoria was his translation of Comte de Caelus's Recoil d'Antiquité. His knowledge of French and fluency in the language was also used to compile the catalogue of the places depicted on the Catherine service, which was sent along with the pieces to Russia. The Great Newport Street in London, where the showrooms were located, were easily approached from both Westminster and the city. The partners were confident of the location, with Josiah commenting that my friends in town tell me it is the best location in all London for my rooms. For Bentley, <clears throat> it was an ideal location. It was in the centre of the artistic and literary community, which became his close associates and friends. It included people like Thomas Day, the author, social reformer and dilettante, James Athenian Stewart, the architect, John Whitehurst, horologist and scientific instrument maker, and the painters Reynolds, Romney, Isaiah Humphreys, amongst many others. It was also convenient for Slaughter's Coffee House, which filled the intellectual and social void created by leaving Liverpool. They met on Wednesday evening, where many other influential men gathered, including Sir Joseph Banks, Captain James Cook, Dr Templeman, who was secretary to the Society of Arts and keeper of books at the British Museum, Dr. Daniel Solander, a Swede and pupil of the celebrated botanist Linnaeus, Don S John Sm Smeaton, the great engineer, George Shuckborough, the celebrated mathematician, Richard Lovell Edgeworth and Ralph Griffiths, amongst others. The importance of these associations reinforced Bentley's connections with the most influential men many of whom became his friends and who he would later introduce to Wedgwood, but they were also invaluable in promoting their productions. 
In the autumn of 1769, Bentley moved into a larger house in Little Cheney Row in Chelsea, very close to the porcelain factory, where he remained until 1777. Bentley's interest and support in the Liverpool Octagon Chapel was transferred to another non-conformist chapel established in Market Street of Cavendish Square. The scheme of worship was to, and I embrace, and I quote, all honest, pious men of whatever creed or form of faith or doctrine. Again, many of the most important and significant men attended services there, including Dr. Benjamin Franklin, Dr. Somerville, the famous Scottish historian, while Sir Joseph Banks and Dr. Solander came to the chapel now and then, but got away as quickly as they decently could. The opening address was given on Sunday, the 7th of April, 1777, but at the end of four years, services were discontinued just at the time when Bentley was dying. Bentley's knowledge of the market and current fashions were vitally important to the partnership. One of the very few surviving letters in Bentley's hands discusses the requirements and actions he believes Josiah should be making for the general improvement of their business activities. He writes in 1770, I think it would be as well to make a few teapots, coffee pots and saucers, sugar dishes and cream dishes in cream colour, particularly calculated for painting and to furnish a déjeuner, as many of these would sell in purple husk. All your coffee pots are too common for this purpose and the teapots must not take up too much room. My love to your good lady, I am always yours, T. Bentley. In managing the London showrooms, Bentley, through his personal connections, endeavoured to dominate the aristocratic market and attain for Wedgwood's wear a special distinction that would filter down through all levels of society. Wedgwood was anxious to use his royal approbation, gained in 1765, for cream coloured earthenware or queensware. By December 1770, further royal introductions were being sought through Bentley's connections. Wedgwood commented to him on the 22nd of December, I am glad to hear you have waited upon Her Royal Highness the Princess Dowager. Though her commands are not great at present, it is good to have an opening and to be known. The former may increase and the latter cannot hurt us. <clears throat> it is evident that Wedgwood's ambition was to be recognised as the potter to the whole royal family. And in September 1771, he responds to Bentley's visit to Windsor Castle. I give you joy upon your gracious reception with their majesties and hope you have sown the seeds of a plentiful and rich harvest, which we shall reap in due time. He continues, their majesties are very good indeed, and I hope we shall not lose their favour and may promise ourselves the great advantages from such royal patronage and the very peculiar attention they are pleased to bestow upon our productions. I hope it will work and have its proper effect and am fully persuaded a good deal may be done in that way with many of their majesty's subjects. We should, if possible, do in this as we have done in other things, begin at the head first and proceed to the inferior members. It is evident that it was Bentley's friendship with many members of the aristocracy and his easy acceptance at court that propelled Josiah's products into the limelight and, courage, and encouraged many titled men and women to visit the showrooms, using them as a social centre to meet their friends as well as view the latest products. Wedgwood was conscious that, at present the nobility and gentry recommend to one another our rooms and they never meet with any other company there. He continues by adding the comment, I need not tell you the many good effects this must produce when business and amusement can be made to go hand in hand. Soon after arriving in London, Bentley started to look for suitable premises to establish a decorating studio, especially for decorating queensware with the addition of monograms and the painting of black basalt vases. Bentley found a potential site in Little Cheney Road, Chelsea, and 
commenced lengthy negotiations with various stringent requirements wanted by him as a potential tenant, which were eventually agreed upon. Josiah frequently refers to the decorating shop as being in Little China Row. There is an interesting postscript to a letter which reads, <clears throat> Mrs Wedgwood says the house and grounds at Chelsea are very cheap at five guineas per annum and think you should not miss them for a trifle. These premises were used until Bentley's death when the painters were moved to Greek, the Greek Street showrooms which had opened in 1774. Bentley was responsible for the discovery and introduction of young artists to the firm, amongst whom were John Flaxman and William Hopkins Craft. The number of painters needed at Chelsea in the decorating studios was heightened by the simultaneous requirement for very skilled artists to decorate both the Husk Service in 1770 and the more celebrated Frog Service in 1773-4 for Empress Catherine II. Josiah wrote indicating his approbation of Bentley's choice and Craft's ability in September 1768, suggesting that it should be either Bentley or Mr Craft who should endeavour to find and employ additional painters, adding, perhaps you may get some better hands from the fan painters, if that business is still carried on, or from the best coach and house painters than from amongst the Chinamen. Bentley believed that he could sell a wagon load of vases a week. Josiah responded, if you sell that quantity in a season, you must have 10 wagon loads of painters to finish them. One vase per day with a fine subject will be as much as one painter can do upon average. Bentley's success in attracting customers in two very well laid out showrooms was proven in London and to a certain degree in the Dublin showrooms. And I think this possibly acted as the catalyst which prompted Wedgwood and Bentley to open retail premises in March 1772 in the highly popular spa town of Bath. The aristocracy and wealthy families frequently stayed in Bath after the London season. Bentley went to Bath where he initially rented premises in Westgate buildings in the recently built terrace on the expanding west side of the city. Although considered to be a reasonable address, it was a little distant from the fashionable centre. Wedgwood commented that he would require six weeks or two months to prepare an assortment of useful wares here, services, etc., and get them to Bath by water. By June, the premises were nearly ready, and although the season was nearly over, Wedgwood, who was in Bath for the benefit of his wife's health, commented that there seems to be at least a good deal of company here, and I wish you would enable us to open our rooms, as I have found some friends here who would bestow some pains in advertising it for us. No other potter who had opened rooms in Bath had been particularly successful, and business was not brisk in Wedgwood's rooms, causing him to write in January 1773, I observe our Bath sales are very moderate. The cause was probably due, as Wedgwood had initially feared, that the shop was not in the main shopping street. The partners moved the premises to the bottom of Milsom Street, a more fashionable and commercially prestigious area. By September 1774, the new showrooms were open for business. The premises contained considerable space for public displays and to hold a large stock of ware. The shop and the new products were regularly advertised in the local paper, the Bath Chronicle, together with all the other social events which was read avidly by everybody saying in the city. Thomas Bentley had an amazing aptitude to maintain close friendships and this is illustrated by his continued association with his brother-in-law William Ward who was a haberdasher in Holborn, London. William's wife Anne was the sister of Bentley's second wife Mary Stamford. When in London Bentley is known to have dined regularly with them and he persuaded William and his wife to leave London and manage the Bath showrooms on behalf of Wedgwood and Bentley. One of Bentley's closest friends was Thomas Stamford of Derby, an engineer of resource and ingenuity who came from a family of considerable standing. Bentley introduced him to Wedgwood, 
in about 1765, and for whom Stanford was subsequently able to provide considerable assistance by developing special tools and appliances for the ceramic industry. Stanford had one brother and a sister, as well as three half-sisters. Being a frequent visitor to his friend's house, Bentley became engaged to the eldest of his half-sisters, Mary. They were married at All Saints Church, Derby, by special licence on the 22nd of June, 1772. And after a very brief honeymoon, the pair returned to Chelsea. The Wedgwoods soon visited and they became close friends. An interesting insight into Bentley's married life is given in a letter from Josiah written in March 1776 after such a visit. Mrs Wedgwood unites with me in love and every good wish to the Bentleys and Stamfords. What a happy man you are with all your friends about you. Methinks I see you with your evening pipe in your mouth and your soul peeping out of your eyes as happy in the circle of your favourite females, as I will not say a king, but as a good man ought to be. May you ever remain so, and so long believe me, you're truly grateful and affectionate, Joss Wedgwood. Bentley had been considering a visit to Paris in the spring of 1776, but had decided not to grow. His plans seemed to have changed rather abruptly. As Wedgwood wrote on the 19th of June, Mrs. Bentley's good letter to Mrs. Wedgwood acquaints us of the revolution in your summer plans, which I think is a very clever one, and hope you will accept the kind invitation given to you by such a celebrated lady as Mrs. Montague. Elizabeth Montague was one of the group of Blue Stockings, a literary society of intellectual women. They were founded in the 1750s and included a remarkable collection of writers, artists, thinkers and social reformers who met in London at the members' houses, especially Mrs Montague's. Their name derives from the colour of the worsted wool stockings worn by the women. Presumably, Thomas Bentley met these brilliant women through his interest and campaigning in, for the importance of female education and probably through the philosophical circles and societies in which he moved in London. <coughs> it would seem probable that the inclusion of Elizabeth Montagu and Letitia Barbold in the illustrious moderns category of portrait medallions was part of the attempt to match figures from antiquity with modern counterparts. It showed a great understanding of the market and a keen commercial eye with both medallions not initially intended as a pair, available by June 1775. Elizabeth Montague was leaving for Paris on the 23rd of June 1776 and obviously persuaded Bentley to travel to France. Bentley arrived in Paris on the 25th of July and called on her the day after his arrival and several more times during his visit in the city. Bentley took the opportunity to have the company's wares shown by Elizabeth Montague to various notable people, commenting in his journal, She has shown a casket of gems, etc., to the Duke or Count de Rochefoucauld, to the Pope's Nuncio, and many other great personages who were highly delighted with them. Tomorrow she desires to show them to Madame Bocage, at whose house she will dine. She is pleased to say, she is proud of showing them and always observes that they are made by a particular friend. The casket of gems would have been examples of cameos and intaglios which Wedgwood and Bentley believed would have particular appeal to the French market. One of the earliest foreign language ornamental wear catalogues was the French edition of 1773, which, as a fluent French speaker, Bentley would have had a significant hand in its con contribution and publication. Bentley stayed at the Hotel Moderna Rue Jacob and kept a journal of his visit, part of which survives. Whilst in Paris, he wrote to Josiah on the 8th of August, I have not much to say to my dear friend as a Parisian, nor would I take up any of that time with my chit chat, which may every moment be filled up with an agreeable amusement or some other pursuit. A more detailed account of Bentley's trip is given in a letter to Samuel Boardman, 
which not only gives a glimpse of their close relationship between the two men, but details the highlights of the trip. He says, though my journey was professedly a journey of expense and amusement, without much attention to directly to business, I was five weeks at Paris and seven weeks away. He then provides a lengthy description of the route to Paris and the topography through which he travelled. He was less than complimentary about Paris itself and the buildings, but added, the city abounds with good libraries and valuable cabinets of curiosities. They have many truly noble collections of pictures, engraved stones and other curiosities. They have some good sculptures in their churches and many good copies of famous antique sculptures from Rome. Undoubtedly, some of the highlights of his stay was his visit to the Serve Manufactory and attending a dinner at which Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were present. However, it was the lengthy conversation with Jean-Jacques Rousseau that he enjoyed most, including their mutual admiration of Benjamin Franklin. Both Bentley and Franklin were members of the Club of Thirteen, a group which met at Old Slaughter's and later the Swan, two of London's most renowned coffee houses. Bentley also took the opportunity to indulge in a small amount of industrial espionage when he toured the Royal Serve Porcelain Factory on the 18th of August. Though he is severe in his condemnation of French taste for ornament, writing, they have an immense number of ornamental vases, highly enriched with enamels and burnished gold. And among several hundred there, there may be about half a dozen very elegant forms. All the rest are neither antique nor gothic, but barbarous beyond conception. His report must have confirmed Josiah in his own opinion when he commented, French and frippery have jingled together so long in my idea that I scarcely know how to separate them, and much of their work, which I have seen, covered over with ornaments, has confirmed me of that opinion. Despite their feelings, some French porcelain was obviously purchased with the specific intention of copying the forms, as Josiah wrote during July 1776. I thank you for the account you have given me of the French porcelain, and when the pieces you advise me of arrive, I will make the best use of them I am able. Similarly, Bentley also took advantage of examining the plaster shops, writing in his journal on the 31st of July. A walk to a plaster shop. Upon examination, found the things much worse than I expected. The honest man told me they were very good, but I spoilt them by looking at them in my glasses. There are but a few fine, fine things anywhere. He must have found something to his liking because an invoice survives for September 1776, which reads, by plaster casts, pastes, etc., bought by Mr. Bentley at Paris, two pounds, 17 shillings and nine pence. From the time Bentley moved to London, his health began to deteriorate. But with the relocation of the showrooms from Great Newport Street to Portland House Greek Street in 1774, it rapidly declined. Number 12 Greek Street had previously been dissecting rooms for the medical profession, and in an age before good disinfectants, there were possibly some detrimental remnants of its former use which affected Bentley. He moved his home to the outskirts of London near Chiswick, in the hope that the country air would do him good. Thomas Bentley celebrated his 50th birthday in January 1780, but his health was gradually declining and he suffered an epileptic seizure on Sunday the 20th of November. Josiah received a letter from Bentley's close friend and neighbour from Turnham Green, Ralph Griffiths, dated the 25th of November. Dear Sir, our poor friend yet breathes. But alas, it is such breathing as promises but a short continuance. Almost every hope seems to have forsaken us. I dread the thought of what will be the content of my next. Adieu, Ralph Griffiths. Bentley's death was a great shock to Wedgwood, who had lost not only his partner, but his best and closest friend, as well as leaving an enormous gap in the lives of his friends in both Liverpool and London. 
a simple announcement was placed in the newspaper. At Turner Green, Mr Bentley, in partnership with Mr Wedgwood, for his uncommon ingenuity, his fine taste in the arts, his admirable character in private life, and his ardent zeal for the prosperity of this country, we will justly admire and will long be most sincerely lamented. His will, made in July 1778, was brief and was proved in January 1781 by his sole executrix, his second wife, Mary. To Ben, to Boardman, sorry, to Boardman, he bequeathed £200. The books and source prints owned jointly by Wedgwood and Bentley and all the books in his library were left to Josiah. But the amount of his other property is not specified in the document. Bentley's funeral was held on Saturday the 2nd of December at St Nicholas's Church, Chiswick, where he was buried in the vaults. A memorial tablet to Bentley was placed inside the church. The bust carved by the Belgian sculptor Schimakers the Younger with the inscription beneath it. The monument was designed and drawn up by James Athenian Stewart, of course his friend. Bentley's death created an immediate complication in the business arrangements as his share of the partnership was bequeathed to his widow. It was necessary to arrange an immediate stock take of all the ornamental wares made before the 26th of November so that the sales could be correctly apportioned. The easiest solution proved to be an auction of the entire Wedgwood and Bentley stock. The sale was held at Christian Ansell's rooms in Pall Mall, London, from the 3rd of December 1781 for a period of 11 days. The sale appears to have been extremely successful, not only as a promotional event, but also to dispose of the majority of their wares, raising £2,182.16.6. It is difficult to assess the impact of Bentley on the 18th century commercial and ceramic scene. His influence on Wedgwood was profound, but it would appear that everyone who came into contact with this remarkable man was influenced by him and affected by his early death. Testimonies and epitaphs appear in Josiah's commonplace book from a wide range of eminent men. But it was the simple words of Samuel Boardman, writing from Liverpool on the last day of 1780, which sum up Bentley's life when he wrote, Our much esteemed friend Bentley, has, for the short time he was with us, spent a happy and useful life. He has left us a noble example of virtue and goodness, which I hope will not be forgot in our actions, both in public and private life. Something which I hope I've shown you in this lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gay. That was wonderful. I'm going to have a look in the chat. We've got one question, Gay, and that was if the child that was born to Bentley's first wife also died uh, that day, or did, did Thomas Bentley have any children? No, the child died, um, as did the mother, sadly. He had no issue at all. Uh, which has been one of the problems, I think, um, in tracing the family, to be honest. I don't see any other questions in our chat. You're receiving uh, wonderful notes about how excellent your lecture was. So we'll just open it up for just a moment to see if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Gay directly. Obviously, this is very much uh, ongoing research. I hope ultimately to produce a monograph on Thomas Bentley. I've mm. touched on various uh, subjects, but a lot of them I've skated over. There is a lot to be found out. But of course, a lot of my research has been hampered by the COVID pandemic because I've not been able to go to either Liverpool or Derby Records office. But uh, I'm hoping with the cessation of the illness, then I will be able to get on and hopefully find some more information about a man I think has been underestimated in our uh, studies of Wedgwood for many years. 
We hope so. That'd be wonderful. Let's see. Um, we've got now a couple questions coming in. Any guesses about what became of Bentley's letters to Wedgwood? Uh, we know from uh, the letters and uh, the archives that Wedgwood had them bound into various volumes. And what I suspect happened in the sale of 1844, when Wedgwood sold Detroria Hall and most of the contents, I suspect they were sold at that time, not realising the importance or implications of them. And I keep looking at every major house in Britain's libraries. I go along all the books at the bottom because I'm sure somewhere they were bought possibly purely as decoration to fill the great libraries. And I sincerely hope that one day somebody doing an inventory of a library will actually come across three, four volumes of Bentley's letters beautifully bound in calf or probably calf and gold lettering without actually realising the importance or of the significance of those particular bound volumes. I oh. trust that they haven't been um, lost. I, you can guarantee that as and when anything is published, they'll somebody will come up and say, oh yes, but here they are, which will put <laughs> everybody's minds uh, into a flurry. Yes. Certainly the uh, part of his journal to France uh, or to Paris actually turned up um, and in Sussex Library in 1977. Uh, and it literally just the lady walked in apparently with it and said, is this of any interest? But sadly, it is only part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. He obviously had at least three and possibly four notebooks, which he kept during that seven week uh, trip overseas. Hmm. That's so interesting. We've got another question. What happened to the silver dish given to Bentley by Griffiths? Sadly, I haven't tracked it down yet. It would have probably gone into the Stamford family because obviously um, his wife would have been looked after by her family on his death. We do know that Wedgwood carried on to manage her financial affairs for her, but I suspect it's somewhere. The interesting thing about the Black Basalt one is it was sent to the Brooklyn exhibition where it was damaged and there is this peculiar little lump on the top of the uh, Egyptian head, which in fact I think should be a taper stick because the description is given of the silver dish as a stand dish, which is actually a description of a desk dish in the 18th century silver terminology. And it would make sense then to have the compartments for the pens, but a taper stick at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, so I suspect that we are looking for something with a little taper stick at the top of it. That's so interesting. And you say your research is going to culminate in a, in a, in a volume on, on Thomas Bentley. Yes, it's something I've been fascinated quietly for for many years because I just feel he's very much the unsung hero of the partnership. And uh, as I've hopefully shown this evening, a lot of what Wedgwood achieved was through the quiet intervention of Bentley. And uh, it would be lovely to actually be able to put his contribution into full context. Not only his work with Wedgwood, but also his work on things like female education, the whole dissenting movement, which was hugely significant in industry um, and commercial terms in the 18th century. And again, it's an aspect that really hasn't been explored particularly well. Yeah, he, hugely fascinating, Thomas Bentley. So many different facets to him. Thank you so much, Gay. Uh, Lorraine, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for today's lecture. Mostly thank you to the all of us behind the scenes and especially Gay, you are, have always been my heroine and this was mind blowing. Um, our next meeting, the next meeting of the uh, WIS Zoom lecture series will be held on Friday, May 14th, again at 2.30 Eastern time. And in May, we will be hosting Rebecca Klarner, who is the Collections and Curatorial Services Officer at the Wedgwood Museum. And her talk is entitled, Therese Lesseur at Wedgwood. And lastly, on the June 18th, Katrin Jones, who is the Chief Curator at World of Wedgwood will speak to us. And her title is, Wedgwood's Networks, a British story, a global trade. 
specific information about each of these lectures and the link of course will be emailed to members during the week of each lecture. And as we have, in addition, we will post the link on our website and on our Facebook page. I would like to suggest that you take a screenshot of this slide that is currently on the screen so that you will have not only the link that we use for all of the Zoom lectures, but in fact, so some of the other links that we think are important. And as I've said previously, all of the lectures are free and open to the public. Um, however, we would uh, love it if you would consider to become a WIS member, and you can do so by going to our website at wedgwoodinternationalseminar.org, where you will find the link, as you see it on the screen, again, to our membership application form. So thank you all. Thank you, Gay. Thank you, Anne. Thank you to David Schwartz, who is our go-to computer person, and we will see you all in May. Thank you, everyone. Bye now.